Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to be looking at the entropy changes in chemical reactions. Up till now, all we've looked at are physical changes. Uh, and those physical changes have to do with compressing a gas, expanding a gas, heating a gas, or cooling a gas. Those are the only types of changes so far that we've looked at. Well, today we're going to look at changes involving some bond breaking and bond making. We're going to be looking at changes in entropy during chemical changes. So we're going to apply the second law of thermodynamics to chemical reactions. So qualitatively, we're going to take a look at the entropy change in those reactions. And we're going to consider a few reactions in a qualitative manner. Let's look at this one. This is one of the most important chemical reactions to modern society. It is responsible for the Green Revolution. Um, Haber and Bosch figured out how to take nitrogen out of the air and combine it with hydrogen to make ammonia, which is a fertilizer. So chemical fertilizers were mass produced after the development by very uh, competent engineers of this process. When we look at it, we can see from the number of moles, one mole of nitrogen reacts with three moles of hydrogen to make two moles of ammonia. We can see that they're all gases. It's very important that you analyze the chemical equation and look at the states. We can see that entropy appears to be increasing or decreasing. What do you think? Well, we have four moles of reactants on the left. We have two moles of reactants on the uh, products on the right. You can see the entropy is decreasing here. Fewer numbers of molecules mean a more ordered system. So in this equation, again, as we said, four reactant molecules become two product molecules. We're having a decrease in the number of molecules or moles, if you want to look, in, <clears throat> look at it in that context. Fewer molecules means fewer possible configurations. So the system is becoming more ordered. What is driving this reaction? We're going to look at that today. So since the entropy decreases, the delta S must be negative. Must be something else driving this reaction. Here's a second reaction. You can see, again, all gases. We have nine moles of reactants on the left. We have 10 moles of products on the right. In this reaction, again, when we compare nine on the left, 10 product molecules on the right, appears that it's becoming more random, more possibilities of uh, more random states. Entropy is increasing. In this case, delta S would be positive. The system has become more disordered because of that increase in randomness of the system with greater probabilities of more configurations with more molecules. So quantitatively, let's look at entropy changes in these reactions rather than just qualitatively. We can determine the absolute values of many thermodynamic functions, but we can't determine the absolute values of enthalpy and Gibbs energy. But we can figure out a change in these thermodynamic states of enthalpy and Gibbs energy. We'll talk more about Gibbs energy in lecture number seven. We can use heats of formation for enthalpy change. We have kind of as a uh, frame of reference established that the heat of formation of a compound from its elements can be established. And we have assigned an arbitrary value of zero to the heats of formation of any element in its standard elemental state as zero. So the absolute values of entropy, on the other hand, can be assigned because we have established a baseline, if you may, that the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin is zero, which means if the particles are perfectly arranged in that crystal, and they're not moving, we can assign a value of entropy, an absolute value of zero. And we've established that is the third law of thermodynamics. 
And that is different from enthalpy values and Gibbs values. The absolute values of those cannot be established. Now, as the temperature goes up, molecules start to move and the entropy of the substance increases because there are more probable uh, states. There are a lot more states that are possible at a higher temperature than at a lower temperature. Entropy change can be found using an equation that is on your information sheet and one you're probably familiar with from high school chemistry. <clears throat> and this equation was derived earlier in the course. It says the entropy change is equal to the number of moles times a specific capacity, which is either CP or CV, dependent on the definition of your state, whether it's at a constant pressure or constant volume, times the ln of T2 over T1. That comes from DQ reversible over T. Now, C, the specific capacity, is considered a constant over the range of these temperature increases. If the C is temperature dependent, the integration has to be done differently. However, we're going to leave that to further courses in upper years of your studies. For this course, we're going to simply stick with the simple uh, situations where C is going to be considered to be, be constant. A list of entropy values is found in your textbook. Note that that little degree sign indicates that it happens at a standard temperature of 298 Kelvin in one atmosphere. It's in Appendix D of your textbook, Petrucci. And we can calculate the change in entropy. This is the equation I was referring to that you're used to using in high school. The change in entropy for any reaction equals the sum of the changes in the entropies of the products minus the sum of the entropies of the reactants, making sure to use the stoichiometric coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. I know from my experience, the most common mistakes students make is they forget to use the number of moles in the balanced equation. Please don't forget to do that when determining entropy changes for chemical reactions. Now, entropy is an extensive property, which means it depends on the number of moles of reactants and products. And that's why we use those uh, the stoichiometric coefficients to calculate it, as opposed to an intensive property. An intensive property does not depend on how big a system is. For instance, if I have a piece of lead, I can have a small piece of lead or a big piece of lead its density will still be the same, the mass divided by the volume. It doesn't matter on how much lead we have because the mass and the volume both increase proportionately, creating the same density. We're gonna now calculate the delta S for a reaction for the reduction of aluminum oxide by hydrogen gas to aluminum and water. When we write the equation out, aluminum has a charge of plus three, Oxygen has a charge of minus two. So we get a formula Al2O3. It's combining with hydrogen gas, which is a diatomic molecule, to make aluminum solid and water. We first analyze this equation. We can see that we have a solid on the left and a solid on the right, a gas on the left, a gas on the right. We can see we have four moles of reactants. We have five moles of products. Let's take a look at the entropies for these different substances, which we can get from a table. Here are the values. Notice when we compare in general, the entropies of gases are higher than the entropies of solids. And that hopefully makes sense to you because there's more random states possible with a gas than with a solid. With a solid, the uh, Particles that make up the solid, whether they be atoms or molecules or ions, are arranged in crystals most of the time, unless it's amorphous. So they have a more ordered state. Gas, on the other hand, the particles are free to roam around and move. So there's more possibilities for random states with gases. And certainly the quantities we look at here reflect that. To find the entropy of the chemical reaction, we can see that we're going to take the sum of the entropies of the products, 
and subtract the sum of the entropies of reactants. So two moles of aluminum times 28 joules per mole Kelvin. Keep in mind that the unit for entropy is different. It's temperature dependent. So it has a temperature in there. And we're gonna add that to three moles of water times 189 joule per mole Kelvin. That's the sum of the entropies of the products. We're gonna subtract the sum of the entropies of the reactants. One mole of aluminum oxide times 51 joule per mole Kelvin, added to three moles of hydrogen times 131 joules per mole Kelvin. That's in the blue, we have the sum of the entropies of the reactants. When we take the difference, we can see it's a positive difference. Does that make sense? Does it look like the system is becoming more disordered? Upon reflection, I would say that you can see that Al2O3 is a highly ordered solid, and it looks like aluminum as a solid is, is <clears throat> less ordered than the Al2O3. Similarly, you can see that there's three moles of gas, three moles of gas. You can't really tell from the moles of gas. In this case, I would simply say the change in entropy, the fact it's becoming uh, more disordered, appears to be explained by the change from the Al203 solid to the aluminum solid. This was more highly ordered. This is less ordered. Makes sense. So delta S for the reaction, keep in mind, this 179 joules per Kelvin, again, be careful with the units. It's an entropy, you need to have a temperature in there. That is for the reaction as written. If we wanted to calculate the entropy for the hydrogen, per mole of hydrogen, we would have to take that 179 joules per Kelvin and divide it by the number of moles in the balanced equation, three we get an answer of 60 joules per mole of hydrogen. Really the same quantity, just express differently. We could also do it in terms of aluminum, in which case we take the 179 joules per Kelvin and divide it by two moles of aluminum. So we could express it in terms of moles of water as well by dividing by three moles of water. But all those quantities really are the same. It's just looking at it from a different perspective from the perspective of the equation or the perspective of a substance in the equation. Be prepared to answer questions of that type on evaluations. Be careful to answer what the question is asking. Now, what are the values of entropy? Why are the values of entropy different for different substances in the same state at the same temperature? Let's analyze that for a minute. For example, why is the entropy of NO2 gas greater than the entropy of NO gas at a particular temperature? Well, we can see the molecules are different. It looks like there's a greater degree of complexity in an NO2 molecule than there is in an NO molecule. That can explain why the entropy is greater for more complex molecules. Recall that delta S is Q reversible over T. And some of the heat raises the average translational kinetic energy of the molecules. However, the energy can be used in other ways, such as vibrational energy. Remember, translational kinetic energy is simply the movement of molecules from point A to point B, whereas vibrational energy is the energy inside the molecules in those bonds. NO2 has a nitrogen attached to an oxygen in two locations. There are bonds in there, a little more complicated than in an NO, there's only one bond in there. So you can only have vibration in one plane. Here you can have vibration in different planes. So the vibrational energies can change. NO, as we mentioned, is a diatomic molecule. It can only vibrate in really one direction. NO2, however, is triatomic, it can vibrate in multitude of ways. So they can all be bouncing away from each other. One can one oxygen atom can be vibrating away from the nitrogen, the other one's toward the nitrogen while the nitrogen is moving as well. And similarly, oxygen could be moving in different directions compared to the nitrogen. So there's different ways that 
the vibrational energy can manifest itself. Since there's more possible ways of distributing that energy among NO2 molecules than among NO molecules, it makes sense to say that NO2 has a higher molar entropy than NO at the same temperature. In general, the more complex the molecule, the, the greater the molar entropy of the substance. Let's take a look at the effect of temperature on delta S and delta H values. Here is a graph for a chemical system. We can see that delta H hardly changes with temperature, delta S hardly changes with temperature, whereas delta G, Gibbs energy, changes quite a bit. So, we're going to use that to our advantage to solve the problems at the end of this lesson. And that's evident by, again, looking at the change here, delta S, delta H, as I mentioned. So we can use tables to figure out delta S and delta H at 298 Kelvin. And those values will be pretty good approximations for delta S and delta H at all temperatures. So that is kind of a neat little trick we can use to our advantage to solve the questions you're gonna be asked to solve. So we can say these two values, delta H and delta S are temperature independent, whereas delta G is temperature dependent. And we will look at delta G and how temperature impacts on it in lecture 107. <laughs> Now, with an increase in temperature, both entropy of products and entropy of reactants increase, but the change is almost the same. So if you think about it this way, we can say, let's say we have a chemical reaction where the reactants have 100 joules of entropy and the products have 150 joules of entropy. The difference is 50. Well, if we increase the temperature, perhaps, the entropy of the reactants goes to 110. The entropy of the products go to 160. The entropies have changed, but the change in the entropy is still the same. Let's consider an isothermal reaction. Almost all chemical reactions are carried out isothermically and isobarically. In this example, Water is reacting with carbon, a solid, to make hydrogen and carbon monoxide, a gas. Upon inspection, we see one mole of water produces, one mole of water gas produces two moles of gases. We have a solid on the left, no solid on the right. So it looks like entropy is in fact increasing. The standard ent enthalpy of formation and entropy values are given. We can find them in a table. Here they are. Again, I want to mention to you, by definition, the heat of formation of an element in its standard state is always zero. However, entropy, absolute entropy values at, at temperature are not zero. One of the big differences in solving enthalpy versus entropy in, in <clears throat> problems that you're going to be assigned. And our standard for calculating enthalpy change, again, is to look at the sum of the enthalpies of formation of the products compared to the sum of the enthalpy of formation of the reactants. When we're forming a compound from its elements, by definition, the elements in their standard elemental state will be zero. So the heat of formation of a substance is defined as how much energy is involved in forming a compound from its elements. For instance, in this case, we would have formed carbon monoxide molecules from carbon and from oxygen. The energy change was 110.5 kilojoules per mole of carbon monoxide formed. The enthalpy of formation of carbon and oxygen would both be zero. The enthalpy of formation of CO would be minus 110.5 kilojoules per mole, which means it's an exothermic reaction when we combine carbon and oxygen to make carbon monoxide. The same could be said for water here. All the entropies note are all positive. The changes are all positive. 
Now, will this reaction go at a temperature of 298 Kelvin? Let's figure that out. And will this temperature also go, will this reaction also go at a higher temperature? So there are ways to determine that. The reaction can only go if the entropy change, the total entropy change is greater than zero. So to get the total entropy change, we're really looking at the entropy change for the universe. To get the entropy change for the universe, we have to find the entropy change for the system and add it to the entropy change for the surroundings. And when we add those two, if the entropy change is indeed greater than zero, we know that reaction will be spontaneous. Let's see how we're gonna calculate this. Here are the quantities involved. Here's the reaction. We know the entropy change for the system is going to be the sum of the heats of formation, or sorry, the sum of the entropies of the products minus the sum of the entropy of the reactants. In this case, the products are hydrogen gas, carbon monoxide gas. We take one mole of hydrogen, multiply it by 130.6 joules per mole Kelvin, add it to one mole of carbon monoxide, times 197.9 joules per mole Kelvin. That's the sum of the entropy of the products. We're gonna subtract the sum of the entropy of the reactants in the same way. When we do this, we get an entropy change for the chemical system of 134.1 joules per Kelvin. A positive change in entropy is happening. Upon inspection, does that look correct? Well, we're taking a solid and changing it into gases. There's no solids on the right, there's a solid on the left. Right off the bat, we see we have one mole of gas on the left, we have two moles of gas on the right. Indeed, it looks like there has been a positive change in the entropy of the system. But what about the entropy change to the surroundings? Let's take a look. Well, we know the heat that is lost from the system is gonna equal delta H of the system, we can use Hess's law again to solve for this problem. And Hess's law says that the sum of the heats of formation of the products minus the sum of the heats of formation of the reactants equals the entropy, cha entropy change for the chemical reaction. Applying that, we get one mole of CO times minus 110.5 kilojoules per mole. Again, notice that the units for enthalpy are different than for entropy. Entropy is temperature dependent, enthalpy isn't. Then we're gonna take one mole of water times minus 241.8 kilojoules per mole. So remember that the enthalpy of formation of hydrogen by definition is zero because it's an element. The entropy of enthalpy of carbon, again, is also zero. So we're only concerned with the enthalpies of carbon monoxide and water. When we subtract the products from the reactants, or products minus reactants, products first, reactants second, we get a value of 131.3 kilojoules per mole is the heat. Uh, that has been absorbed in this case by the system. So heat has flown in or flowed in from the surroundings into this chemical system. It's an endothermic change that's happening here. So it looks like we have some opposing forces. It's getting more random, but the change caused by the heat flow from the surroundings into the system is going to be opposing the force of entropy, increase in randomness. So let's continue to see if the reaction is spontaneous at this temperature. To do that, we have to calculate the entropy change for the surroundings. And we know the entropy change for the surroundings is Q surroundings divided by the temperature of the surroundings. In this case, it's 298K. The Q surroundings, is the amount of heat that flowed from the surroundings into the chemical system. We know that those that change in heat energy is gonna be equal and opposite in sign. 
We calculated it to be 131.3 kilojoules per mole is flowing from the surroundings into the chemical system. So Q system is going to be minus 131.3 kilojoules, the opposite sign, divided by the temperature at which it's happening, 298. I want to change the kilojoules into joules. To do that, we're going to multiply by 1,000 joules per kilojoule. And we end up with a value of minus 441 joules per Kelvin. So the surroundings, because they've lost heat, are becoming <clears throat> less random. They're becoming more ordered. So the delta S total, or the delta S of the universe, is going to be the sum of the entropy changes for the system and for the surroundings. Keep in mind, the heat flow at 298 was sufficient to create a delta S total that is negative. Our calculation has shown that indeed at 298 Kelvin, this reaction is not spontaneous because of the total entropy change. Now let's again look at this curve, which we talked about earlier. If we calculated delta H and delta S at 298, we can assume that the delta H and delta S at any temperature will be almost the same. So we come up with an approximation for a calculation of whether or not this reaction is spontaneous at 1298 Kelvin. We're going to use that assumption. It simplifies things. So we're going to assume the delta H at 1298 is the same as the delta H at 298. And the delta S at 1298 is the same as the delta S at 298 for the actual system that's reacting. The system being the reaction of water and carbon producing hydrogen and carbon monoxide. So delta S at 1298 is going to be the same quantity that we just calculated at 298. It's about 134.1 joules per Kelvin. For the surroundings, the delta H at 1298 is going to equal 131.3 kilojoules, which was about the same as the delta H at 298. We're going to call that the minus QP of the surroundings. The surroundings lost heat to the chemical system, endothermic process. So delta S surroundings, however, will be slightly different because the surroundings were at a higher temperature. The surroundings were at 1298 Kelvin. So Q reversible, which was minus 131.3 kilojoules, is now to be divided by the new temperature, 1298. We're going to change the kilojoules to joules by uh, using 1,000 joules per kilojoule, and we get a new value for delta S surroundings is minus 101.2 joules per Kelvin. You can see that the delta S total is equal to the delta S of the system added to the delta S of the surroundings. And when we perform the calculation now, we see that the value for delta S has changed. The value for delta S total is a positive value at 1298K because of the change in the calculation for delta S surroundings. <clears throat> this positive value will in fact drive this chemical reaction to spontaneity at 1298 Kelvin. So the critical temperature at which this chemical reaction becomes spontaneous must be somewhere between 298 and 1298. We saw it wasn't spontaneous at 298. We saw it was spontaneous at 1298. In the next lecture, lecture 107, we're going to show you how to calculate the temperature at which a chemical reaction is spontaneous. In the meantime, what I'd like you to do, there is a problem set in on Q in Appendix A. You should be starting to do the questions in that problem set, on that problem set. And again, do the questions on your own before you look up the answers. As well, at the end of this lesson in your course pack, there are additional problems. There's two of them that I would like you to attempt on your own. Again, go through that struggle process. <clears throat> Once you've struggled to get the answer, if it's incorrect, 
then take a look at the solution and analyze it, figure out where you went wrong, or hopefully you follow the instructions that were given to you in this lecture and you're successful. All right, so thank you very much for participating and uh, stay safe, please. We'll see you in the next lecture when we talk about Gibbs Energy. Thank you very much. Bye now.